So uh, before we get into uh, recurrent nets, we first have to discuss embeddings. And so why we need embeddings is because text is generally human readable, and that's fantastic. You know, it obviously makes sense for humans to read uh, text, but the problem is machines have a difficult time dealing with uh, textual data. In fact, you know, text in what that you see on your machine actually corresponds to uh, things like character sequences and characters. You know, are can be unsigned, actually just numbers, right? And so, what's actually going on is that we assign a numerical value to each character, and then based on that, we can, you know, like draw the character or, or whatever. And so, machines deal with machines deal with numbers much easier than 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 humans do. And so, we need some way to convert human readable text into something that the recurrent network can actually read, and that's what we use embeddings for. And so the whole point of this is to convert a word or a character into a vector. And so vectors are great because we've already seen ways that we can use neural networks on vectors, and so this works. This works out uh, very well. So the whole, this is the kind of the whole point of using embeddings is to convert human readable text into some numerical value like a vector. And so how we do this is we use an embedding. And a bending is just a fancy name for a trainable lookup table. So it's basically just uh, a table that takes a particular word or a character and converts it into uh, a vector. So it just takes a particular character and says, hey, this is a vector that corresponds to this uh, character. So remember that this is trainable. So that means that the input to this, for example, would be just a character or a word, and the output to this is going to be some is a vector of some dimensionality, and so you can choose what that dimensionality is. You can use like a, you can say, let's take our word and convert it to a hundred-dimensional vector. Let's convert it to a three-hundred-dimensional vector, right? And so that's kind of like a hyperparameter of of the network. That's something that we kind of have to figure out uh, for ourselves. But what the output the output of this embedding is is trained. So uh, what what I mean by that is the it's not, you know, some kind of, it's not like hard coded at all. The embedding is actually trained. And so when you give it a word and it produces a vector, that vector has actually been trained. So there's actually two different ways that we can train this. Uh, one is we can actually learn this jointly with the entire network. So in Keras, for example, you would just use an embedding layer and it would learn using back propagation what the best values for that vector uh, should be to maximize you know, a particular likelihood when we're training, for example. That's, you know, what, that's what we're, what we're trying to do here. That's what happens when you learn it jointly with the network. That means that that does increase the number of parameters your network uh, has. On the other hand, it turns out that people have actually used word vectors in the past and they have specialized uh, training algorithms and loss functions for uh, training word vectors. And it's actually really cool. I'll show you at the, kind of the end of the slide deck what you can do with pre-trained vectors and so what you can do is actually get pre-trained uh, word vectors and so then something like word to vec or I know Stanford has uh, pre-trained glove word and word vectors and it's basically just you can treat it like a Python dictionary where you just throw or you look up a um, uh, a a word and it produces some 300 dimensional vector uh, I think so I think somewhere around 300, although it could be a 100-dimensional vector. I think there's different models for that. But anyway, that is kind of the whole point of the uh, of the embedding. And the dimensionality of the embedding space, in other words, when you produce the output, it produces a vector in some with some dimensionality. That's actually a hyperparameter. There are some rules of thumb, actually, for selecting this that we'll get to when we uh, actually get to our code. Okay, so how do we actually create uh, our, our, our embedding. And so uh, what we have to first do is select what we want our vocabulary size uh, to be. And so it's what this capital V is supposed to represent, and that's just kind of like a hyperparameter. So you say like maybe in your in your text, you look at it and you know you have like 5,000 words or something. So you say I want a vocabulary of like 5,000 and um, you know if we don't Get, we don't the words that aren't in that vocabulary. We have to replace them with something uh, with something else. So 
we, after we selected a vocabulary size, we keep the top, so if our vocabulary size was 5,000, for example, we look at our data and we kind of organize it by word frequency. So based on how the more frequent a word appears, the more uh, it's going to be kind of moved towards the bubble towards the top. And so we want to retain those words. We want to retain the most frequent of 5,000 words. Now that being said, there might be words that don't make that list. They just don't make the cut. And so we'll, we'll, there's a way that we can deal with this actually pretty simply. So what we do is we add these kind of meta words for an unknown word and then for padding. And we're going to get to padding in, in a second. So that way, if a word doesn't make the top 5,000 words in the vocabulary, or if we maybe later on when we're testing, we encounter a word that isn't in the vocabulary, we replace it with a meta word for unknown word. I'm going to have examples of this, concrete examples of this, actually very soon. So just bear with me here. So uh, yeah, that's kind of the whole point of the uh, of having a vocabulary, and then. Now, reason another reason why we do this is that we can't anticipate every single word that we can expect, and that also increases the computational complexity. And so we usually just say we'll use a vocabulary of like 5,000, and then have some meta words for like an unknown word, um, padding. If we're doing something like machine translation, we need something to denote the start and the end of a sentence, uh, for example. And so that's what we would use this uh, embedding for. So after we have a vocabulary. The cool thing is when we have this, we can actually take a, each word or each character and convert it into a one-hot vector, right? Because we have a vocabulary, we know what the words are, and we have a kind of like a, a vocab meta word for an unknown word. And so we can take our entire data set and convert it into a one-hot vector. And so we can take each word, convert it into a, a one-hot vector, right? So it's just going to be a, it's going to be a five thousand dimensional vector with a single one in the, in the position of the uh, in the position of the correct word so after we have after we have that we can stack these word vectors into matrices so if I like a sentence I take each I take a, each uh, word I convert it into a one hot vector and I stack them together into a matrix right and so now I have you know if I my sentence had three words in it I have a matrix that has three rows, where each row is a word, and then its number of columns is that five is has five thousand columns because that's the dimensionality. So I just basically just stack them into a matrix. Now, if I have multiple sentences, right, and they're not of the same length, I have to do some kind of padding so that I, you know, so that I can actually stack them all together. And then, essentially, what's happening is I have this embedding matrix. And it's really just a matrix multiply. So I just take that and I multiply it, and then that converts my three by five thousand dimensional uh, three by five thousand matrix into a three by whatever my embedding dimension, three by a hundred, for example. And so this kind of also helps with uh, dimensionality reduction in that sense. And because these are all one-hot vectors, it turns out this is actually the same thing as just selecting a row of the embedding matrix. So the, the matrix that has all of our embeddings, it's actually just doing a selection operation, really. That's kind of the the thing that's actually going on. Because if you think about it, if our if our vector has you know, a one in a particular in the ith position, and we do a matrix multiply, that's basically the analogy of selecting the ith row of the embedding matrix, because everything else is zero and we just have a one in the ith position. And so that's just you know corresponds to corresponds to doing that. Uh, okay, so I guess I'm going I'm to stop right here. And so this kind of gives you a top level overview of how these embeddings actually work. And in the next video, I'll actually have an exa a concrete example that kind of goes through this uh, step by step. I think will really help uh, with with understanding. So in the next video, we're going to do a concrete example uh, of embeddings.